Welcome to Lit Poetry, the podcast where we go on a journey of discovery, reading, analyzing, and discussing great poetry from around the world. Poetry is worth it because the reading and writing of poetry is a revolutionary act that has the potential to transform both the reader and our world. Welcome to the fourth circle of hell, and to the twisted imagination of T.S. Eliot. And welcome to the story of one J. Alfred Prufrock, who's been walking these parts for some time now. A hollowed out, pitiful husk of a man. He's my guest here, of course. Fuel for my empire. He's preparing the way for the masses that will surely come. (laughs) But I digress. Now let me say a few things before we start. The first six lines of this poem that you are about to hear are in Italian and are taken from Canto 27 of Dante's Inferno, which traces a pilgrim's journey through my own kingdom of hell. While in my home, this pilgrim meets some of my sinful subjects, and one of them, a man named Guado, tells the pilgrim that he feels free to tell him his sins, because he knows that pilgrim cannot escape how. So the infamy of his sins will never reach the ears of his loved ones back on earth. Now you may ask, Why would Elliot choose these lines at the start of his poem? Well, probably because Prufrock's own story that the poem traces is kind of like Guado's, in that it contains secrets told in confidence. The allusion to Dante's Inferno therefore suggests that the speaker in Prufrock is trapped in a kind of hell himself from which he can't escape. But enough of me waffling on. May I present you with The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock by T.S. Eliot. This poem is read to you by the deviously talented Matty Overall from Matty's Storyland channel on YouTube. Si credissa che mi risposta fosse a persona che mai tornasse al mondo, questa fiamma staria senza puiscose. Ma però che diami di questo fondo non torno vive alcun, si odo il vero, senza tema d'infamia ti rispondo. The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock by T.S. Eliot Let us go then, you and I, when the evening is spread out against the sky like a patient etherized upon a table. Let us go through certain half-deserted streets, the muttering retreats of restless nights in one-night cheap hotels and sawdust restaurants with oyster shells, streets that follow like a tedious argument of insidious intent to lead you to an overwhelming question. Oh, do not ask what is it. Let us go and make our visit. In the room, women come and go, talking of Michelangelo. The yellow fog that rubs its back upon the window panes, the yellow smoke that rubs its muzzle on the window panes, licked its tongue into the corners of the evening, lingered upon the pools that stand in drains, that fall upon its back the soot that falls from chimneys, slipped by the terrace, made a sudden leap, and seeing that it was a soft October night, curled once about the house and fell asleep. And indeed there will be time for the yellow smoke that slides along the street, rubbing its back upon the window panes. There will be time, there will be time, to prepare a face to meet the faces that you meet. There will be time to murder and create 
and time for all the works and days of hands that lift and drop a question on your plate. Time for you and time for me. And time yet for a hundred indecisions and for a hundred visions and revisions before the taking of a toast and tea. In the room, the women come and go, talking of Michelangelo. And indeed, there will be time to wonder, do I dare, and do I dare? Time to turn back and descend the stair with a bald spot in the middle of my hair. They will say how his hair is growing thin. My morning coat, my collar mounting firmly to the chin, my necktie rich and modest, but asserted by a simple pin. They will say, but how his arms and legs are thin. Do I dare disturb the universe? In a minute there is time for decisions and revisions, which a minute will reverse. For I have known them all already, known them all, have known the evenings, mornings, afternoons. I have measured out my life with coffee spoons. I know the voices dying with a dying fall beneath the music from a farther room. So how should I presume? And I have known the eyes already, known them all, the eyes that fix you in a formulated phrase. And when I am formulated, sprawling on a pin, when I am pinned and wriggling on the wall, then how should I begin to spit out all the butt ends of my days and ways? And how should I presume? And I've known the arms already, known them all, arms that are braceleted, and white and bare, but in the lamplight downed with light brown hair. Is it perfume from a dress that makes me so digress? Arms that lie along a table or wrap about a shawl. And should I then presume? And how should I begin? Shall I say, I have gone at dusk through narrow streets and watched the smoke that rises from the pipes of lonely men in shirt sleeves leaning out of windows. I should have been a pair of ragged claws scuttling across the floors of silent seas. And the afternoon, the evening, sleeps so peacefully, soothed by long fingers, asleep, tired, or it malingers, stretched on the floor here beside you and me. Should I, after tea and cakes and ices, have the strength to force the moment to its crisis? But though I have wept and fasted, wept and prayed, though I have seen my head grown slightly bald, brought in upon a platter, I am no prophet, and here's no great matter. I have seen the moment of my greatness flicker, and I have seen the eternal footman hold my coat and snicker. And in short, I was afraid. Would it have been worth it, after all, after the cups, the marmalade, the tea, among the porcelain, among some talk of you and me? Would it have been worthwhile to have bitten off the matter with a smile, to have squeezed the universe into a ball, to roll it towards some overwhelming question, to say, I am Lazarus, come from the dead, come back to tell you all, I shall tell you all. If one, settling a pillow by her head, should say, that is not what I meant at all, that is not it at all. And would it have been worth it, after all, would it have been worthwhile, after the sunsets and the dooryards and the sprinkled streets, after the novels, after the teacups, after the skirts that trail along the floor, and this and so much more. It is impossible to say just what I mean, but as if a magic lantern threw the nerves in patterns on a screen, would it have been worthwhile if one, settling a pillow or throwing off a shawl and turning toward the window, should say, that is not it at all, that is not what I meant at all. No, I am not Prince Hamlet, nor was meant to be. I'm an attendant lord, one that will do to swell a progress, start a scene or two. Advise the prince, no doubt an easy tool, deferential, glad to be of use, politic, cautious and meticulous. 
full of high sentence but a bit obtuse, at times indeed almost ridiculous, almost at times a fool. I grow old, I grow old, I shall wear the bottoms of my trousers rolled, shall I part my hair behind, do I dare to eat a peach, I shall wear white flannel trousers and walk upon the beach. I have heard the mermaids singing each to each. I do not think that they will sing to me. I have seen them riding seaward on the waves, combing the white hair of the waves blown back when the wind blows the water white and black. We have lingered in the chambers of the sea by sea girls wreathed with seaweed red and brown till human voices wake us and we drown. There are many literary allusions in this poem, in addition to the ones to Dante's Inferno, that give us insights into the poem's key themes and ideas. Outside of Dante, the speaker also refers to Lazarus and to John the Baptist from the Bible and to Shakespeare's Hamlet, when the speaker laments that I am not Prince Hamlet. Furthermore, the description of the singing mermaids alludes to Homer's The Odyssey and the classical trope of the sirens who seduce men and lead them to their demise. The impact of these many allusions in the poem is used to draw out negative comparisons between the feeble and confused Prufrock with more worthy literary figures in Western literature like John the Baptist or Hamlet. For example, in the poem, Prufrock's own head, if served on a platter like John the Baptist, would be slightly bald, he says. Likewise, if Prufrock was to play a role in Hamlet, it would be an inconsequential role, like an attendant lord or even a fool. These self-criticisms highlight the speaker's sense of alienation in the world. Published during World War I, the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock surprised many critics of the time with its irregular metre and rhyme, its unsettling subject matter, and its critique of modernity. Prufrock is a noticeable poem from the modernist period because it is one of the first poems to break away from well-established modes of literary expression practised in the Victorian era. Rejecting strict metre and form, modernist poetry adopted a more organic form of free verse. In the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, Eliot takes shards from older traditions and reshapes them. And Prufrock has, ironically, become a great in another kind of way the first great modernist poem, with its revision of traditional forms and haunting depiction of the effects of isolation in the modern world. Prufrock was an inspiration for later modernist poets, like William Butler Yeats and W.H. Auden, who dealt with similar themes. Welcome back. So I want to say a few things about some of the themes and ideas in the poem, starting with an exploration of social anxiety, indecisiveness and unfulfilled desires that can lead to a sense of disenchantment in life. In this particular poem, Prufrock is incapacitated by indecision. Indeed, Prufrock's energy is constantly stymied by his digressions, his mind constantly distracted by self-doubt and a sense of his own ineptitude. Within the context of Prufrock's spiralling thoughts, the poem implies that an obsessive preoccupation with what is acceptable in how to relate to others or in simply choosing how to present oneself can actually prevent a person from ever engaging with the world in a meaningful or life-giving way. The poem creates a tension between the act of living and procrastination. The poem begins with the words, let us go, but Progress in this dramatic monologue of a poem 
clearly falters. The streets Prufrock travels along become a tedious argument of insidious intent and reinforce the notion that the way forward is unclear. Prufrock's indecision is anchored to his feelings of social anxiety and fear about making bad decisions, with even small choices too much for him to bear. He is full of, he says, a hundred indecisions, and for a hundred visions and revisions. Even the thought of greeting people tortures him internally, and highlights his nervousness. And he also worries that people will laugh at the way he looks and dresses to the point of paranoia. Added to this, he imagines being overwhelmed in social situations by not knowing, how should I begin, he says. How should I begin to ask people questions or maintain a conversation? When he says, how should I presume, the reader starts to get the impression of a very awkward, nervous individual fumbling his way through life. His failure to make basic choices on how to act leaves him with feelings of impotence and frustration. He lacks the agency and the dare required to set himself free. There are moments when Prufrock draws close to acting on his desires, but the poem ultimately demonstrates that wishing to act isn't enough. Meaningful actions require confidence, self-love and bravery, qualities that Prufrock, a symbol of the modern alienated individual, simply lacks. Prufrock's desires are fantastical. He procrastinates and agonises over his choices until the opportunity to act is gone. As for Prufrock's clear yearning for romance and affection in the poem, he is doomed also to dissatisfaction. Indeed, even though the poem itself is called a love song, the poem never quite reaches such lofty heights and remains anticlimactical. Romance, after all, requires a vigorous engagement with life, and it also requires good communication between people. For Prufrock, his inability to communicate well leads him into a world of fantasy roleplay. In the poem, he imagines himself nobly expressing his desires and feelings for others. For example, he pitches his response to an overwhelming question, saying, I am Lazarus, come from the dead, come back to tell you all. I shall tell you all. However, although the speaker compares himself to this biblical figure and offers the promise of total revelation to tell all, he doesn't actually manage to communicate much of anything. Rather, he imagines his audience falling asleep and needing, he says, a pillow by their head. Even in his fantasies, then, he experiences the disappointment of being unable to communicate, protesting that this is not what I meant at all. That is not it at all. In the end, Prufrock's distress hardens like concrete. He ends by suggesting that even the mermaids will not sing to me. Instead, he will grow miserably old until the hopes and dreams he swims within simply drag him out to sea and drown him whole. Okay, so this particular poem isn't the most uplifting piece to discuss, but nevertheless, it remains important because it warns us, the reader, of just how damaging modern society can be. Most of us can at least sympathise with how Prufrock feels. After all, we all live in a world that claims to be the most interconnected than any other time in history, but the irony is that most of us know just how shallow a lot of this so-called interconnectedness is. The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock is a poem that deeply explores this modern condition. The poem emphasises exciting features of modern life, like electricity and new medical technologies, but it also suggests that modernity comes with a persistent sense of alienation and isolation from others. Prufrock himself highlights this. The poem mentions various technologies that, in the early 20th century, like lamplight, Industrial factories and hospital anesthesia were considered wonderful breakthroughs, but these technological changes seem to have left Prufrock behind. 
He explains how the yellow fog slides through the streets like a cat that rubs its back upon the window panes, but he rarely interacts with actual people as the streets are half deserted. The yellow fog seems more alive to him than the people themselves. Prufrock is weary of the world, in which events follow a monotonous fashion cycle. He claims, I have known them all already, known them all, have known the evenings, mornings, afternoons, I have measured out my life in coffee spoons. There are no real surprises in this society for proof rock. Just boring humdrum rituals of a polite society preoccupying itself with small amusements. For proof rock, he longs to live life big and to force the moment to its crisis. But society itself is happy to remain mundane and to focus on such things as tea and cake and ices. In other words, through Prufrock, Elliot is arguing here that there is something emotionally deadening and alienating about the seemingly empty rituals that characterise the modern world. Just think of all the things we do today to distract ourselves from our fears and our pain. Of course, a really fascinating part of the poem is the women who kind of make a refrain in the poem talking about Michelangelo. This discussion of Michelangelo illustrates a really important point. Here I think Elliot might be talking about how people in society can sometimes pontificate about life and the wisdom they possess, when in reality they are only really armchair experts full of their own egos and self-importance. I just love these tongue-in-cheek lines in this wonderful poem. So that's it for episode 3 of the Lit Poetry Podcast for season 4. I really love this dark and disturbing poem. And can I suggest to you that my own analysis offered here is perhaps inadequate at best. There is so much more to this poem and I would encourage you all to read a little bit more about it. I want to thank once again Matty Overall for giving me access to his reading of the poem. Check out his Storyland channel on YouTube. Next week we'll be looking at an old love poem from a very famous poet. I think he's somewhere down here. We'll finish by listening one more time to the poem. I really hope to see you next time. Si credissa che mia risposta fosse a persona che mai tornasse al mondo, questa fiamma staria senza puiscose. Ma però che diami di questo fondo non torno a vive alcun, si odo il vero, senza tema d'infamia ti rispondo. The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock by T.S. Eliot Let us go then, you and I, when the evening is spread out against the sky like a patient etherized upon a table. Let us go through certain half-deserted streets, the muttering retreats of restless nights in one-night cheap hotels and sawdust restaurants with oyster shells, streets that follow like a tedious argument of insidious intent to lead you to an overwhelming question. Oh, do not ask what is it. Let us go and make our visit. In the room, women come and go, talking of Michelangelo. The yellow fog that rubs its back upon the window panes, the yellow smoke that rubs its muzzle on the window panes, licked its tongue into the corners of the evening, lingered upon the pools that stand in drains, let fall upon its back the soot that falls from chimneys 
slipped by the terrace, made a sudden leap, and seeing that it was a soft October night, curled once about the house and fell asleep. And indeed there will be time for the yellow smoke that slides along the street, rubbing its back upon the window panes. There will be time, there will be time, to prepare a face to meet the faces that you meet. There will be time to murder and create, and time for all the works and days of hands that lift and drop a question on your plate. Time for you, and time for me. And time yet for a hundred indecisions, and for a hundred visions and revisions before the taking of a toast and tea. In the room the women come and go, talking of Michelangelo. And indeed there will be time to wonder, do I dare, and do I dare? Time to turn back and descend the stair with a bald spot in the middle of my hair. They will say how his hair is growing thin. My morning coat, my collar mounting firmly to the chin, my necktie rich and modest but asserted by a simple pin. They will say, but how his arms and legs are thin. Do I dare disturb the universe? In a minute there is time for decisions and revisions, which a minute will reverse. For I have known them all already, known them all, have known the evenings, mornings, afternoons. I have measured out my life with coffee spoons. I know the voices dying with a dying fall beneath the music from a farther room. So how should I presume? And I have known the eyes already, known them all, the eyes that fix you in a formulated phrase. And when I am formulated, sprawling on a pin, when I am pinned and wriggling on the wall, then how should I begin to spit out all the butt-ends of my days and ways? And how should I presume? And I've known the arms already, known them all, arms that are braceleted, and white and bare, but in the lamplight downed with light brown hair. Is it perfume from a dress that makes me so digress? Arms that lie along a table or wrap about a shawl. And should I then presume? And how should I begin? Shall I say, I have gone at dusk through narrow streets and watched the smoke that rises from the pipes of lonely men in shirt sleeves leaning out of windows. I should have been a pair of ragged claws scuttling across the floors of silent seas. And the afternoon, the evening, sleeps so peacefully, soothed by long fingers, asleep, tired, or it malingers, stretched on the floor here beside you and me. Should I, after tea and cakes and ices, have the strength to force the moment to its crisis? But though I have wept and fasted, wept and prayed, though I have seen my head grown slightly bald, brought in upon a platter, I am no prophet, and here's no great matter. I have seen the moment of my greatness flicker, and I have seen the eternal footman hold my coat and snicker. And in short, I was afraid. Would it have been worth it, after all, after the cups, the marmalade, the tea, among the porcelain, among some talk of you and me? Would it have been worthwhile to have bitten off the matter with a smile, to have squeezed the universe into a ball, to roll it towards some overwhelming question, to say, I am Lazarus, come from the dead, come back to tell you all, I shall tell you all. If one, settling a pillow by her head, should say, that is not what I meant at all, that is not it at all. And would it have been worth it, after all, would it have been worthwhile, after the sunsets, and the dooryards, and the sprinkled streets, after the novels, after the teacups, after the skirts that trail along the floor, and this and so much more. It is impossible to say just what I mean, but as if a magic lantern threw the nerves in patterns on a screen, would it have been worthwhile if one, settling a pillow or throwing off a shawl, 
and turning toward the window, should say, That is not it at all. That is not what I meant at all. No. I am not Prince Hamlet, nor was meant to be. I am an attendant lord, one that will do to swell a progress, start a scene or two. Advise the prince, no doubt an easy tool, deferential, glad to be of use, politic, cautious and meticulous, full of high sentence but a bit obtuse, at times indeed almost ridiculous, almost at times the fool. I grow old. I grow old. I shall wear the bottoms of my trousers rolled. Shall I part my hair behind? Do I dare to eat a peach? I shall wear white flannel trousers and walk upon the beach. I have heard the mermaids singing each to each. I do not think that they will sing to me. I have seen them riding seaward on the waves, combing the white hair of the waves blown back when the wind blows the water white and black. We have lingered in the chambers of the sea by sea girls wreathed with seaweed red and brown till human voices wake us. And we drown. You've been listening to the Lit Poetry Podcast, presented by James Laidler. For more podcasts, poetry videos, and other useful resources, visit our website at www.litpoetry.com. Thanks for listening.